This is really cool. Thank you all for being here. So, uh, yeah, the future of the World's Fair. I guess we'll start where, where anyone would start with this, in 1886 in Paris. So that is the Eiffel Tower. Or, at least, it's the 15 proposals that were submitted to the organizing committee of the 1889 World's Fair. Um, as you can see, they are pretty weird, and any of them could have become the Eiffel Tower. Um, they were all submitted to be the, the main monument to the World's Fair in 1889. Um, next. So that is the first drawing done in 1886 by Gustav Eiffel's architecture firm, which was a big firm at the time. This drawing actually wasn't done by him. It was done by two of his senior engineers. Um, as you can see, there's like the Statue of Liberty on the right-hand side. Little known fact, as I guess all of these are, um, Gustav Eiffel also designed the, uh, oh cool, also designed the frame of the Statue of Liberty. So this is, I want to stand up. This is the Latin Observatory, which Gustav was very clear inspired him to design the Eiffel Tower. And this was built for the 1853 World's Fair in New York, which was the first ever World's Fair to take place in the US. Um, he th felt that he did it much better. This burned down in a fire a few years later, which is why you don't see it. So this is the tower that you guys all know. It was built for the World's Fair in 1889 as the entryway into the fair. So people walked underneath it, and they walked basically. And they walked from this way into the fair. So this is a picture of the World's Fair. Like this big tent right here is literally the World's Fair. And at the time, people thought it was super ugly. And they were like, this tower sucks, tear it down. There was an entire coalition of architects and designers that were like, Paris, this thing's ugly. It's an eyesore in Paris. And so what Gustav did, the, the smart fellow that he was, turned the tower into a radio transmitter um, and made it like integral to the local community and businesses. And because he aligned incentives, it stayed and wasn't torn down. Um, I have a clicker. No way. No way. That's crazy. Um, so I read a book four years ago called The Devil in the White City, which was written by Eric Larson. And so that was this, this line, the long one right there. And so in that book, I learned that, like, 27 million people went to this event over six months when the entire U.S. population was 63 million. So 42% of the entire country went to an event traveling on horse and buggy and train. No, there were no cars at the time. And like that was the first time that human beings got to see electricity used on a large scale thanks to Nikola Tesla. And like, you know, the Ferris wheel designed by George Washington Gale Ferris Jr. was built specifically for that World's Fair and all these other things. And so I learned that and I was like, wow, this thing's pretty cool. Like, where, where's the World's Fair? And so I went down like a rabbit hole and kept learning more and more about them. And I eventually learned that World's Fairs do still happen every five years around the world. They're known as World Expos. Um, 2010, Shanghai, 73 million people went. 2015, Milan, 29 million people, myself included. And then 2020 will be Dubai. And so then I was like, so they still happen. Tens of millions of people go. Why not in the U.S.? Because in my mind, like, the U.S. is the best place to hold this international showcase of the future because, you know, we create the most future and the international community typically looks to us first for most things. So then I learned the reason why is that in 2002, the U.S. canceled its membership in the international treaty organization that oversees present-day World's Fairs, a.k.a. World Expos. And so then I was like, hmm, maybe, maybe I could do it. Um, and so that's when I got the idea that maybe a private organization could pick up where the U.S. government left off and organize, you know, the next Great American World's Fair. And so, you know, our goal is to organize a, a six-month, 100 million person event in the U.S. Um, you know, it focuses on all things future and international that is then, <laughs> that's, thank you. Um, and in order to get there, we're starting smaller. Um, so basically what we're doing is trying to basically build a case for why the World's Fair could actually work. So like this event, World's Fair Nano, is basically like a mini World's Fair. So it's like, you know, two days, a few thousand people, 
interactive tech demos, talks, art. Um, and our point is we're basically going to be growing like a future and tech and art focused events business into this big thing called a World's Fair. Um, and my, my, my interest in it started when like all these things are just insane. Like the x-ray machine, the space needle, the IMAX screen, even the present day, the urban maglev train. And what like I noticed that just set me down this path was that like we need a reason to do incredible things. And people need a reason to like progress. Um, and it's hard a lot of times to find what the reason is. And what I noticed from like 150 years of data of World's Fairs was that it consistently gave people a reason to do big, globally progressing things. And so, you know, I think that it, it puts this just inevitable deadline on progress when you, you start planning years out for this six month event that 100 million people are going to and it's international and you're spending billions of bucks on it, like we step up. Like mankind, humankind, I think steps up, um, which is evident in, in the history. And so, you know, like we have, you know, it's like, can you create the first ever 100% renewable community? It hasn't been done, we haven't done it. Um, can we become an interplanetary species? Can we feed nine billion people? Who knows? But I think in order to do it, we're going to have to do some fairly radical stuff, and it's going to take a ton of courage. And to come up with those ideas and have the courage to actually see them through, I think the World's Fair is the perfect thing. Um, and so, like, you know, one of our goals is to organize the six month fair with a dual purpose design to the fairgrounds, first as this like six month event space for this thing called the World's Fair, that's then converted cost effectively into a 100% renewable extension of the host city. Um, and like, there's no reason you can't do that. There are good case studies historically of like London 2012 converting um, into a post-use, like Montreal in uh, 67 for that expo converting to a post-use. The trick is that it just you have to plan for it and you need um, the incentives to be aligned like long-term. So typically when it's a public organization, that is the organizing body of like a big event, a World's Fair, an Olympics, a World Cup, whatever. They do it and their interest is like nation branding and like just being cool in the international community, which is all well and good, but the trick is like, they're not a good long-term custodian um, because they don't have the same financial interest that let's say like a private developer would have in, in seeing their project succeed. Um, which is why like, you know, you see what happens in Brazil for the World Cup, what happens in 1964-65 in Flushing Meadows in New York. Um, and so I think, you know, the World's Fair done right with, with the, right, the right approach can literally change civilization. Thank you. You guys have any questions? I'm happy to... Good, that is a good question. Wow, right to the chase. Um, yeah, so um, one nice thing about like Worlds for USA versus other, versus every other effort in the history of World's Fairs, is that um, because like the whole thing started with the recognition that a World's Fair in the U.S. is just an incredible tool for the future, um, we've gotten to look at the entire country for where to do it, and so we've done a pretty extensive search of every 500 plus acre undeveloped site near a major U.S. city that has sufficient public transit terminals, um, airport terminals, and overnight accommodations. And the three that we've actually pinned on is New York, um, Houston, and Chicago are the three sites that we found. Yeah, so um, we are a long way from being able to justify, you know, funding the three to $10 billion or more project that this is. But the, the way that, uh, that we think about it is like a real estate project. So if you look like Hudson Yards, it's like an $18 billion project. Um, but you know, like you see your returns over 20 years. Um, and the way that, you know, why I think the World's Fair is an incredible tool for building a physical renewable future is because you can basically underwrite the cost of that future through the revenue streams of the World's Fair, which are ticket sales and sponsorship. Um, so you approach it like a real estate project from a financing perspective um, that, in my opinion, is a sick return 
because you get um, ideally all of it back from uh, from the, the fair revenues. But as far as like you know us being able to, to make that pitch in a realistic way, we have to keep doing more of these, make money doing this, um, do our first 50,000 person event, million person event, and then eventually someone will, will break and be like, all right, you guys can do the fair. Yeah. No, so this is the first time it's been privatized. So the BIE, which is the Bureau of International Day Expositions, which is like the, over, the, the international treaty organization that oversees present day World's Fairs, AK World Expos. It's much like the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, just for World Expos. And the BIE today is actually a 169 uh, country organization. So the US is like super in the minority for having canceled its membership in 2002. Um, and so yeah, every other expo effort is, um, World's Fair effort is like NGO, quasi-governmental organization from Milan in 2015, Shanghai in 2010, Aichi Japan in 2005, um, Hanover in 2000, Dubai in 2020, it's all governmental kind of entities. Cool. All right, thanks guys, have fun this weekend. <laughs>